my third week of prayer at Andrews, and I realize it's privileged to come back. But what good is a week of prayer? Why do we keep doing this year after year after year, when apparently so many could care so little? Those who were in attendance in Lincoln, Nebraska, had an exciting experience on Friday evening. Pastor Ron Halverson gave that marvelous lecture from gangs to God. He candidly told of his past life and how the grace of God reached down to the very gutter of the ghetto and scooped him up and made something out of him. And as he was telling of his conversion experience, there was one part that, was, that had me on the edge of my seat. He was telling of awful things Satan involved him in in the daytime, or rather at night, and then every day he would hook school and go out to Greater New York Academy to the week of prayer. In the week of prayer, heaven came down and Ron Halverson became... A child of God. Well, that's what they're good for. And it can happen to somebody here. And on the other hand, those who are already walking with the Lord can be drawn nearer to Him. That's what I pray for, and I believe that's what you're interested in. Am I right? I trust, therefore, that we will worship together to our mutual benefit as we enjoy the presence of the Lord. I'm glad to be with you, students. One of my high privileges is to talk to our young people in our schools around the world. And I told the president, as long as they'll listen, I'll be glad to do it, because it's nice to talk to our young people. Our subject this evening, the besetment. And in Hebrews 12, a very familiar text with perhaps an unfamiliar idea, at least it was to me, as I got into some interesting books one day. In that first verse that we've all read so many times, wherefore... Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, definite article, the, the sin that doth so easily beset us. Now, I've preached on that, I suppose, as much as any text in the Bible. I've read it many times. I've quoted it many times in sermons from uh, one place to another. Not so long ago, as I was reading several scholars in what they had to say about Paul's writings to the Hebrews, I came upon an idea that, frankly, I'd never seen before. It seems that in this particular text, Paul was in one of his ethereal literary moods. He was flying high, and he coined a word, a word that is translated beset in that text for us. But the scholar who dealt with it said that it's almost a grotesque expression in the original. He suggested that it's found nowhere else in Greek literature, only here. And in order to help us understand this word that gave him such a start, he came up with an approximate definition of it. And this is what he said it meant. The well stood a rounded sin. Let us lay aside every weight and the well stood a rounded sin. What is the meaning of this? What made Paul dredge into the very bottom of his heart to come up with a word like that? A word that is so difficult the, the real meaning doesn't seem to come through in the authorized version or any other for that matter. What did he mean? Well, I found some definitions and I added some. The well stood around its sin is the sin that is backed by millions upon millions of people in present society. The well stood around its sin is the sin given hospitality by the masses. The well stood around its sin is the sin considered all right when it's definitely wrong. The well stood around its sin is the sin which men delight to proclaim, the popular sin that commands the suffrages of the world. The well stood around its sin is the sin which receives the endorsement of scholars and psychiatrists 
and other medical men. Paul here then is not exhorting us to stay away from sins that bite and sting and shame. He's not saying that at all. He's talking about those sins that are well stood around it. Sins that have a circle of admirers who've sort of thought it through. And then a concentric circle of unthinking people who are guarded in by the herd instinct. And then that circle is increased by three and three thousand and and three hundred thousand until millions upon millions believe it. The well stood around it sin is a sin that many are proud of. The well stood around it sin could be that perversion that is quoted by the fireside or on party couches. Maxims that are written in bold letters. Shadow shallow philosophies that mock God and mock His throne and debase humanity. Paul is saying, let us lay aside that kind of sin, that damning sophism that takes us in its snare because everybody else is doing it. Let us lay aside the well-stood-arounded sin, the popular sin, the sin that everybody thinks is okay. Let's put that one aside. That is the besetting sin. Let's get rid of that one so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us. Now that's found in chapter 12 of Hebrews. In chapter 11 we find what we like to refer to as God's honor roll. A list of men and women uh, whom Paul cited as having overcome the well stood around its sin. They overcame the sin that could have brought fame and riches and popularity. They overcame it by faith. Which means that if you find a moral injunction in the Word of God, you've got to believe that if you're the only one who believes it. And those who are listed in Hebrews 11 were like that. Now very quickly, there are some well-stood-arounded sins that seem so innocuous and so harmless and so, so easy to get along with. One that is almost a generality throughout the world is that we make our heaven or our hell right here, that one world is enough, that we ought not worry too much about the hereafter. A very bright young man stood up at Columbia Union College and said, one of the problems with the Seventh-day Adventist Church is it is obsessed with eschatology. And while he saw it as a problem, I said in my heart, thank God, for the three angels' messages are eschatological. It's what we're supposed to be dealing with. I'm sorry to say, but the higher we go in our academic pursuits, the more gullible we seem to be to this sophistry, this well stood around its sin, to the point that we literally become ashamed to hope beyond this world. And those who talk about it seem to be uttering profundities, punctuated with a laugh and a curl of the lip and a look around for approbation with defiance to our theology, to the church, to the altar, to the very throne and the very purposes of God. And yet this sin will effectually kill character, aspiration, and everything else because it deprives us of faith and of hope. For if this world is all we have, how wretched and how miserable we are. Those who lead out in this world talk daily of a coming eco-tastrophe. They coin words to fit our age. They talk about pollution, and I could spend 15 minutes on each of these. When I was a boy living in the country, you could walk through the woods, and if you became thirsty, you could stop at any stream and scoop it out. And I'm not that old, but you'd better not do it now. Everything seems to be polluted. I clipped an article the other day written by men who ought to know what they're talking about, who suggest that the capricious weather we are having today is the result of man tampering with the enterprises of God with their fallout and with their explosions and with their testing. And then what they call a problem bigger than the, than the nuclear uh, bomb problem is the population explosion. Almost a year ago I was sitting in a hotel in California when there came a news flash right in the middle of the news and it said the fourth billionth person had just been born. Then they suggested that it took 5,000 years to get 1 billion people. It took only 100 years to get the second billion. It took only 35 years to get the third billion. And the fourth billionth person was born in 15 years. 
And the man who talked about that said, if the trend continues, by the year 2020, there will be so many people on earth, this earth cannot sustain them all. Ladies and gentlemen, if this world is all we have to look forward to, we have to admit that we have very little to look forward to. Now, the reason the devil likes this well stood around in sin is that it takes our eyes off eternity. And if you stop looking at that, you will forget about preparing for it. And everything you do will be motivated by something selfish, something earthly, something carnal including educational pursuits. Do you know that today, and it's a sad thing to say, and I'm not talking about our institutions alone. Now, please understand that. I'm generalizing. But today, men and women are complaining that many of those who are in school are motivated by the idea of material prosperity. And that's a sad thing. There was a time that we at least said to ourselves, We're interested in service to the helpless and to the defenseless. But all of a sudden, the world has become too large because our concepts are too small. We seem to forget that this great big earth is but a small member of God's astronomical household. We need to understand there's something beyond. There is something bigger, or else we'll fall into a trap. And I tell you tonight, I have gone to physicians and dentists who appeared to be obviously motivated more by their quest for money than making me well. You see what this does? This well stood around in sin, prostitutes our professional gifts, and makes even of those in the healing arts professional extortioners. It was said on the news a week ago, that physicians today sit down at the beginning of the year and decide how much money they're going to make. And when a patient comes in, he's just a means to an end. But we look back on chapter 11 and we find someone there who says, I overcame that well stood around its sin. My name is Abraham. I was a wealthy man. I was a goldsmith in the land of Ur. I had a fabulous home, a good reputation. Everybody looked up to me, but I left my country and my father's house and went out into a desert because I could see beyond. I could see beyond. I ask us not to think only of our own convenience. Ladies and gentlemen who love the Lord, Ellen White says in these last days, it will become very precious to serve Jesus. Very precious. Now, if that needs interpreting, I'd like to add a word. The time is going to come when everybody who likes excuses for doing wrong will have plenty. The time is going to come when every earthly thing will have to go on the line for your faith. The time will come when homes and cars and boats and stereos and televisions and clothes and microwave ovens and electric crock pots and everything else might have to be given up for one's faith. I heard one of our preachers say, you might walk out of your house and reach back to lock the door and decide it's no use and just drop the key on the front porch and head out to the caves and the rocks, leaving a well-stuffed refrigerator behind. Ellen White says God is dishonored when we try to prepare for the time of trouble. We're going to have to eat his bread or go hungry, drink his water or go thirsty. The just shall live by faith. Now closely akin to this well stood around its sin is a mockery. They refer to us as pie in the sky Christians. We're looking for something by and by. And they say to us, eat and drink and be merry. For tomorrow you die. And King Hedonism sits on the thrones of our hearts, suggesting an interminable round of rock and drugs and sex and orgies of concupiscence. While we wait to indulge overtly, we relish vicariously these cheap thrills on television and in the movies and in the books that we read and the magazines we peruse 
And our theme becomes fun and games. Fun and games are well screwed around in sin. Moses in chapter 11 cries out, I forsook that one, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And I like the way he puts it. He said for a season. He admits there's pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. For a season. You may go and rock around the clock, but it's for a season. For a season. You might go out and indulge every fantasy your carnal mind has ever dreamed of, but it's for a season. For a season. And I have gone into the death rooms of men and women who were pleasure mad, and I've seen them disdain those things on their deathbeds. They are seasonal. Moses said, I put it aside. You see, pleasures perish with use. And the psychiatrists tell us that what, what's happening in America is we've tried everything, and now we are mad for new kicks and new thrills because the old things don't give us the jolt they used to. Even our music must have the accompaniment of marijuana in order to be enjoyed, they say. We taste well in the mouth, but it's deadly in the belly. And we have come to low wretchedness that I never dreamed I'd live to see, such as kitty pornography and the ravishing of old women for thrill. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let us put aside that well-stood-arounded sin and rejoice in the blessed hope. Christ is coming. There is a world beyond. There is an eternity. And we must face it prepared or unprepared. We're going to spend it somewhere. There is life after death. And there is punishment, too. <laughs> I heard Pastor Collins tell a story once of a man who was attacked by a dog, and he killed a dog. And after the dog was dead, he took a stick and just kept beating him. And someone came up and said, you can quit now, the dog is dead. He said, yeah, but I want to teach this rascal there is punishment after death. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, there he is. Another well stood around in sin is the idea that nothing is wrong anymore. Let us then liberalize our religion. You may liberalize your religion, but you cannot liberalize God. There are some things that have always been wrong, and they always will be. So please, I appeal, do not listen to those who question the credibility of preachers and of the spirit of prophecy and of the Bible and of God himself by saying some things are not wrong. Out of chapter 11, Joseph cries, oh yes, there are things that are wrong. And even though he was tempted by a beautiful life, and voluptuous woman, he said, I cannot. This is wrong. It might be convenient and it might be appealing and I might be tempted and I might want to do it, but it's wrong. And I cannot commit this sin against God. Something's wrong. Now, you know me, at least some of you do. I'm always straight ahead and, and I'll offend somebody. But I offend folks because I'm offended. Like Jeremiah, sometimes I'm filled with the fury of the Lord. When on our campuses, we stand up to applaud the well-stood-arounded sin and take minister to, ministers to task who tell us that homosexuality indulged is wrong. It's wrong! Not against homosexuals. They can go to heaven like any other sinner if they stop sinning. But the act is wrong. And the other day somebody opened the book of Leviticus and read the condemnation, spit in the Bible, and cast it to the ground, and we're going to take sides with that. And another person bordering on infamous blasphemy read from St. Paul that he would that all men abide even as I. And they didn't explain what Paul meant. And they did not say that St. Paul again was in one of his ethereal moods and sometimes Paul darkened the skies with his opinions. 
But at other times he came down to earth and became the supreme pragmatist, and nobody wrote more tenderly about the home and the marriage and the wife and the husband than St. Paul. It was Paul who said it's better to marry than to burn. It was Paul who said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love your wives as your own flesh. It was Paul who gave instructions concerning the marriage privileges and said they should not be denied except the two consent for fasting and prayer. And it was Paul who said, don't even fast and pray too long, lest the devil tempt you through your incontinence. On the other hand, nobody, nobody was sterner in his rebuke of Sodom and homosexuality than St. Paul in Romans chapter 1 where he spoke of men with men and women with women, doing that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their evil which was meat. I heard a great preacher say the other day that when a man indulges in carnality of this type, he hurts himself more than anyone else on earth. It's wrong. And even though the world today takes it up, because the world is approaching another generation willfully impenitent and hopelessly lost, just as Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, because prophecy is being fulfilled, let's not jump on a bandwagon like that. Let us lay aside the applauded sin. And let's stand for something. Oh, I'm not talking about indulging. I'm talking about up here where we give consent, up here where we say, okay, up here. Skepticism destroys faith. Another well stood around it seeing is the old idea that seeing is believing. And people will teach evolution as though it were a fact and question creationism. I would submit that both are theories and both must be received by faith. And it's just easier for me to believe that God made me than to believe I came from a monkey. Just easier for me to believe that. Huxley, who was called Darwin's bulldog, admitted that his master's idea was an hypothesis. Not proved, it's not a fact. If there's anything I enjoy watching on television because there's very little to enjoy, it's Jacques Cousteau and his... Underwater adventures, and nearly every time he comes on with this stuff about millions and billions of years ago. Yet we can blindly accept that, but when it comes to the Word of God, we've got to see. And who sees? Wise men don't trust their eyes anyway. If it's too far away, they use a telescope. If it's too small, they use a microscope. If it's very precious, they use a special lens to examine it. But when it comes to truth, we've got to say. We are creatures of faith. And every day we live by faith. I told the youngsters up there in Lincoln, you come in and sit in these benches by faith. Nobody has a guarantee that that particular pew won't collapse and break your back. You sit under this roof. You don't know it won't fall in. You sit here by faith and the builders and the architects. You go to the lunchroom and eat that food by faith. <laughs> Somebody could have gone mad and poisoned the whole pot. We live by faith. The well stood around its sea and drags the mind down with brutal ignorance. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. How on earth? He lived hundreds of years before Christ, and yet he saw my day. How did he see it? In the vicarious death of the ram caught in the thicket in the place of Isaac, Dr. Harding said, Dr. Harding in his marvelous lecture said that when Abraham was arrested by God, the knife was in his hand. He was about to plunge it into the bosom of Isaac when God called his name, Abraham, Abraham. Now I see. Look around and find a sacrifice 
and he found a ram caught in the thicket. Dr. Harding said he caught a ram whose horns were entwined in thistle, bush, and bramble. And he put it still another way, a ram wearing a crown of thorns. Abraham saw my day and was glad. Abraham not only saw that, but he saw beyond. He saw what could happen through Christ. There's a little text in the Bible, and I don't want to make more of it than I should. Please don't misunderstand me. But in Hebrews 11, where I've been talking, it says that these all died not having received the promise. Now, God made a promise to Abraham and repeated it to Isaac and repeated it to Jacob. And he told Abraham one day, look, and everywhere you look, this shall belong to you. And yet the man died not having received the promise. He had to go buy a little plot of ground to bury Sarah. Well, now, did God fail to keep His promise? I say God never fails to keep His promise. How then did Abraham die not having received the promise? I would like to suggest another way. Abraham, you see, looked beyond and he saw the river of life and all of a sudden the river of Jordan was too shallow for him. Abraham saw the tree of life bearing twelve manner of fruit and he lost his zest for a land flowing with milk and honey. Abraham saw the righteous raised in the second resurrection, and he remembered that he had buried Sarah in the land promised. And it was almost as though Abraham said, Lord, you promised me this, but no thanks. I've seen something else. Now I'm just a pilgrim and a sojourner. I look for a city without foundations whose builder and maker is God. I look beyond. Oh, beloved, let us look beyond. Let us not fall for this idea of a well-stood around it saying, only what you see. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Word turns our attention to Christ and says, Consider Him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become weary and faint in your mind. For ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. And how many times have I read that and thanked God for it? But one writer said, it could be that that text should read this way. Such contradiction of sinners against themselves. Now here is another and... Direct meaning. Sin hurts those who practice it. Sin is against themselves. When Christ was about to die, He was the object of derision. He was reviled and despised and rejected and persecuted and tortured and finally murdered. But on His way to Golgotha, He turned to the women whose hearts were broken by the sight of blood and He said, O women of Jerusalem... Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Dr. Taylor says, nowhere in the Gospels can you find record that a woman ever went against Christ. I think that's wonderful. No woman ever persecuted him. No woman ever lied on him. No woman ever tried to stone him to death. No woman drove a nail. No woman put a cross on his shoulder. And so these tender-hearted women stood along the way. Their delicate sensibilities offended by what they saw. And they cried softly. Jesus paused and said, Oh, women of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for yourself and your children. You're doing this to yourselves. And on the cross they wagged their heads. The Son of God was hanging there, dripping with blood and sweat and spit. And he cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They're committing suicide. They're doing it. To themselves. And when he arrested Paul on Damascus Road, he said, why are you kicking against the pricks? Oh, there's a load of... Uh, of that's pregnant with meaning. Kicking against the pricks. Bruising your own foot and breeding mortification in your own toe. You're just wearing yourself out. Fight against God all you want. Or his throne is sure. You're just hurting yourself. Or as the old folks said, when I was a boy, you're blind to your own interest. You know, hostility at least has dignity, but stupidity has nothing to be said for it. And it's stupid to fight against God. If we are not punctual and, and, and 
careful about our work here at this school. We are hurting ourselves. If you goof off and practice immorality and get hung up on drugs, you're hurting yourself. Sin is against yourself. You're entering your own prospects. And nothing is more pitiful than seeing an old has-been regretting that he didn't make something out of himself. As the old folks used to say, they're standing in their own way. Jesus said they aimed all of this at me. And it does have a distinct bearing on my personal feeling, for I am crucified afresh. But if they could only see what they're doing to themselves. The way of the transgressor is hard. Young people, please say amen to that. The devil convinces people that it's tough being a Christian. I declare the way of the transgressor is hard. You're not just breaking some outside law when you go against God. You're injuring yourself. God says, all that I ever prohibited, I did it in your interest. I only told you not to do that which would degrade you and debauch you and shame you and ruin you. If we do not rest and take exercise and eat well, we're hurting ourselves. We're not hurting health. Health still stands, dictating the true regimen of wisdom to those who will hear and saying to those who won't, Oh fool, why would you come to ruin? For nothing. You did it against yourself. If you don't read and study and pray, if you sit through a week of prayer with a chip on your shoulder, you're not hurting the preacher. You're hurting yourself. If you miss this golden opportunity to draw near to the Lord, you're injuring yourself. You're not spiting the professors or the parents. Yourself. What happens when one does not pray and one does not study? Mental feebleness happens. Bigotry happens. Narrowness happens. Sectarianism happens. Obstinacy happens. Economic depression happens. Another well stood around it saying is the idea that Christ is irrelevant, that we don't need him now. I was reading something on comparative religions and it said Christians ought to stop running all around the world trying to convert everybody. Anybody else's religion is as good as theirs. And it was said in very high-flown polysyllabic language. And sometimes we look at that and say, Ah, this must be true because it sounds good. A well stood around its sin, and all of a sudden the non-Christian nations are seething and explosive. And their gorillas can come out and explode a bus loaded with little children and, dope, and then go home and issue a communique to the world saying, We did it and we are bragging about it. Yeah, Christ is needed after all, isn't he? After all. In closing, my young friends, let me say it one more time. If you go into a dark room and shut out the sun, you're not hurting the sun. The sun keeps on shining. And if the sun could speak, it would say, Oh, fool in darkness, here I am. Let me in, and I will show you apocalypses of color and miracles of light. Here I am. You cannot live without me. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. Christ sat on a hillside, and I've been there, at least where they say he sat. And from that vantage point on the shoulder of the Mount of Olives, you can look across the Kedron to what used to be the glory of Israel, the top of Mount Carmel. And Christ sat there looking, and he saw... The temple in its splendor, the white marble which Herod had imported from Rome, and the gold-plated pinnacles gleaming like holy fire. And in a soliloquy greater than Hamlet's, and in a voice of unspeakable sadness, with the tears streaming down his face, dripping out of his beard, Christ spoke, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens, but you would not... You did it to yourself. And methinks I hear the echo of the ancient prophet saying, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. You did it to yourself. 
And our problem is we're so human. And these well-stood-arounded sins appeal. These ideas take us easily. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because it's such a prevailing idea. We are caught in it. You have to fight it, young people. You have to resist it with good sense. You can't just flow along with the sentiments of the crowd. You've got to think it through, tested by the Word. And if God says it's wrong, put a pin in what God says and stand on His promise, though you stand alone. And remember, it'll be very precious to serve Jesus before the end of time. But I've never met a person who made such a decision who turned out regretting. I had a sister-in-law who, for years, acted as though she despised the faith that I love. Her husband was not in it either, my brother. And finally, I went to their town and started a tent meeting, and they came every night. And you could see the change. And by God's grace, I baptized my older brother and his wife. Years later, that wife, a registered nurse from Liberia, lay dying of cancer. I walked into her hospital room for the last time with my wife. We spent three hours one Sabbath with her. You'd have thought we were just in her living room. Never did she talk about sickness and trouble and sorrow. There was a radiance that fought against the debilitating disease, and, and conquered so that you saw it in her eyes. And then it was time to go. And she pulled herself up in that bed and reached out with both hands, and she took mine in one and my wife's in the other, and looking us right in the eyes, she said, Now listen, you two, I might not see you again down here, but if I don't, I'm going to look for you around the throne of God. And then she said, do you hear me? And I think I shall never forget. I've never known a person to stand with Christ who ended up regretting. Now, this is the first night of the week of prayer. Where do we go from here? Are we just going to cruise through this one? Or do we want a blessing? Do you want a blessing? If you do, I want you to stand on your feet right now, please. And bow your heads. And don't stand if you don't mean it. Maybe you, you the rest, will stand tomorrow night. Or the next. Or whenever you may listen to Christ. But let us pray. Lord, you've brought me, even me, back again to this campus for another week of prayer. And this imperfect instrument needs the tongue of an angel to say what ought to be said. I'm so glad there is another person involved in this encounter. He is called the Holy Ghost. Through him, speak to our hearts this week. Wake us up. Help us to get past complacency and the utterly stupid idea that we're smart if we don't surrender. Please touch hearts. No man alive can do that. Help the sorriest person on this campus to know how much you love him, dear Lord. And that he is just as precious in your sight as the preacher who preaches the sermon. And help us to respond to that love. As we go to our rooms tonight, please let us be sober. Now, I know these are young people and they're full of life and vigor. That's the gift thou hast given. 
They are gregarious. They like each other. They love to laugh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But help them still to be sober, for these are solemn times which demand thought. And if you will hear us and bless us, we will ascribe all glory to thee, because we are here tonight only in the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you, dear Lord, for this privilege and for hearing us. And before we end this prayer, we beg that in our hearts, right now, we would ask for cleansing and receive it by faith. In the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.